Hi kids, welcome back. We're now going to start post-World War II activities and we're going to start with the development of jets. Of course, jets were starting to be developed before the war, but they really came into their own at the end and at the, after the war. First question is, what's a jet? Before there were jets, there were superchargers and turbochargers on piston engines, and these were used to put more air into the engines, especially as you went up on higher altitude. Here's a cool video from the Garrett Corporation explaining turbochargers. A turbocharger provides an effective solution to one of the challenges facing many engine makers. How to breathe more air into the combustion chamber and do it efficiently. Here's how a turbocharger works. To get more air into the engine, a turbocharging system starts with an engine exhaust gas, power that is essentially wasted in non-turbo engines. This exhaust gas is channeled into the turbo, where it spins a turbine wheel. This highly engineered wheel spins quite fast, reaching speeds of up to 280,000 RPM. On the other side of the turbine wheel, connected by a shaft, is a compressor wheel. These two wheels turn together, and the rapid spinning allows the compressor to suck in large amounts of ambient air and compress it. As a result, the air is very dense and has a higher temperature. This air then passes through a charged air cooler, where it's cooled and gains an even higher density prior to entering the engine. What's in the engine? The compressed air allows the engine to effectively burn more fuel, making for extremely efficient engine operation. With better combustion, engine makers no longer have to resort to building bigger engines to get more power. Instead, they can use smaller, more fuel-efficient boosted engines, then match the power of the larger engine, while consuming up to 40% less fuel and emitting significantly less CO2, making turbocharging a technology that's perfectly in tune with the needs of the 21st century. So as you can see, turbochargers are designed to cram more air into a piston engine, whether it's a gasoline engine or diesel engine. And so for airplanes, that means you can keep uh, your uh, power up at higher altitudes as the air gets thinner or on the surface, as the video just showed, you can get the same amount of power with a smaller displacement engine by cramming more air in there. It also means you end up needing uh, higher octane fuels, but that's a story for another day. Between uh, piston engines with turbochargers and turbojets, there was an intermediate phase. In the uh, early 1930s, in 1931, an Italian aeronautics engineer called Secondo Campini had an idea for sort of a, a mix of the two. He had a piston engine running a compressor, which went back to a uh, section where you introduced more fuel into the compressed airstream, burned it, and then shot it out the back through a um, variable geometry exhaust valve. And the idea was to produce jet thrust this way. Um, that worked uh, moderately well. It was tested in uh, August of 1940 um, in an aircraft built by the Caproni company, the, called the Caproni Campini. And uh, it ended up going about 320 miles an hour. But as they said at the time, the performance of the aircraft was underwhelming, especially after they found out about the Henkel 178. So they determined that the, this basic design couldn't produce sufficient thrust to make it uh, produce enough thrust to go faster than current piston engine airplanes. So they ended up abandoning the project. But, but here you can see a picture of the Caproni Campini. It's a, basically a big tube. Here it is with the aft tail section removed and you can see the, where the fuel bar sprayed fuel out and see it burning there. And here's some video of the Caproni Campini flying. 
So that's the Caproni Campini, kind of an intermediate between piston engines and true jet engines, which we'll get to now. So you can see there, the, you have a compressor and you have a turbine, um, and in between is a piston engine. Some folks wondered, why not get rid of that pesky piston engine, all those moving parts? Just take the output of the compressor and burn the uh, air, air and a, a fuel mixture and then shoot it through the turbine. That would be a lot more efficient, I presume, than having all those pistons and valves going up and down. So such pioneering work on those things were accomplished by two men working in parallel, really without any knowledge of each other. The first was Sir Frank Whittle in the UK, who began his research in about 1930. The second guy was a German named Hans von Ohain, who began his research a little bit later in 1936. Uh, Ohain's jet flew first, and that was the flight of the Henkel HE-178 in 1939, very about the same time that uh, Germany was invading Poland. Whittle's jet flew next, the, the aircraft called the Gloucester E-2839, and that was in the spring of 1941. Here's some cool videos of those aircraft flying for the first time. Aerial history was made in July 1944 when an RAF Mosquito, one of the few Allied aircraft easily able to penetrate German airspace, was shot down by a Messerschmitt 262 flown by Lieutenant Alfred Schreiber, to whom fell the distinction of achieving the first ever jet fighter victory. If the ME-262 represented the cutting edge of fighter technology in 1944, it was the consequence of early German interest in the use of jet propulsion for military aircraft. Indeed, in the Heinkel 178, which took to the air on August the 27th, 1939, Germany had flown the world's first jet aircraft. Power was provided by jet engine offering a maximum of just over 1,000 pounds in thrust. In itself, the 178 at this stage represented nothing more than a technical novelty, having no military use. For Heinkel, it had, however, demonstrated the possibility of developing a jet-powered machine that could be employed for more militant purposes. Indeed, he had already initiated studies in 1939 for a twin-engine jet-powered fighter using two new and more powerful engines. The resultant HE-280 was, at the time of its first flight on April 2, 1941, undoubtedly the most advanced aircraft of its type in the world. Powered by two jet engines, each delivering nearly 1,300 pounds of thrust, the HE-280B1 achieved a maximum speed in tests of 485 miles an hour. The fitting of an improved turbojet was expected to raise this to 570 miles per hour. By the spring of 1942, the testing of a succession of prototypes had, in Heinkel's view, proven the concept of the 280. However, its fate was to be sealed by its engine. Heinkel's own design never produced the planned thrust, and switching to the Junkers Umo turbojet meant employing the same engine as the ME-262. The latter, which was now flying, was deemed by the Luftwaffe to have greater potential, and on March 27, 1943, Heinkel was instructed to abandon the 280.
It's important to point out that both the Henkel 178 and the Gloucester E2839, those aircraft were technology demonstrators, proof of concept aircraft. They were not prototypes. They were not designed to be fighters or anything else. They were designed to test a jet engine and an airplane, which had never been done before. So later developments, both, the, both of those aircraft would lead to other operational aircraft. In the UK, jet research led to the operational Gloucester Meteor in July of 1944, and Germany fielded several jets. The Henkel 280 was a twin jet fighter, which looks an awful lot like the ME-163, but it turned out Hitler was pissed at Henkel and liked Willie Messerschmitt more, so the Messerschmitt ME-262 went into production. Arado had their twin-engine jet bomber and reconnaissance aircraft, the AR-234. Henkel also had the Henkel 162, which was a plywood single-engine jet fighter, the Volksjäger, or the People's Fighter, uh, which was a took people who barely had glider experience, put them in a jet, and sent them up against American bombers. Did not work out too well. Early in the war, the UK, worried about being overrun by Germany, provided the U.S. with a wealth of technical information, data on the Whittle jet engine, the first jet engine, and a bunch of other uh, technologies, along with the uh, design for and actual examples of the cavity magnetron, which made microwave radar possible. They sent that all over just in case Germ or, uh, Germany invaded England and England fell. So the U.S. Uh, took that technology and sent it to U.S. Uh, manufacturers. The first U.S. jet was actually made by GE, and they had turbine experience because they had made water turbines and uh, steam turbines for different uh, uses um, for ships and for hydroelectric power. So they already had turbine experience, and so they were sent the, the plans for the Whittle jets. Bell Aircraft was given the contract for the first jet, fight or jet test aircraft, and that was the Bell XP-59. It was a twin-engine jet. It didn't perform horribly well, but again, this was a technology demonstrator, not a prototype. It turned out that uh, aircraft like the P-51, the Ds through Hs, were actually much more capable uh, as aircraft, fighter aircraft, than anything based on the Bell P-59 would be. Here's some videos of the Bell P-59 in action. On October 1st, nine weeks before Pearl Harbor, a disassembled Whittle W-1 engine was loaded into the bomb bay of a B-24 Liberator and flown to America. General Electric was chosen to manufacture the engine in the United States. The project proceeded under the strictest security. Of the 1,000 employees working on the jet engine, less than 100 were permitted to know what they were building. Just six months after receiving Whittle's engine, GE tested their own prototype, known as the IA. The new engine generated about 1,250 pounds of thrust. Meanwhile, Bell Aircraft was building the airframe for America's first jet. The twin-engine fighter was designated the XP-59A. The completed aircraft was taken apart and shipped to Muro, Dry Lake, California, still under the strictest security. The XP-59 was even fitted with a fake propeller to disguise its revolutionary design. It was the most secure program there was in the military other than the A-bomb. Uh, we, we came up with the idea of that dummy propeller a wooden ring with four slabs of balsa wood went out in four different directions, so when the airplane was outside the hangar, we just stuck that on the nose. So from a, from a distance, it looked like a normal propeller. On October 2nd, 1942, just one year after receiving the Whittle engine, the XP-59A Arrow Comet became the first American jet-propelled aircraft. Colonel Bill Craigie was the officer in charge of experimental aircraft, the United States Army Air Corps. After the historic flight, Bell test pilot Bob Stanley offered Craigie a turn at the controls of the XP-59. I didn't really expect to 
uh, to be offered a chance to fly it. It took me two and a half miles to get the airplane off the lake bed when I took off. My recollection of the first flight was at the moment of leaving the ground, it was so quiet, but normally that's the period when you maximum vibration and rattling and shaking of the, and a piston engine and all that. Well, this, because of the type of propulsion, rotary instead of piston action, it was very smooth. And uh, it made a tremendous impression on me. Bill Craigie had become America's first military jet pilot. The XP-59 never performed up to expectations. It barely exceeded 400 miles per hour and didn't handle as well as the best piston engine fighters. Nevertheless, the Air Comet launched America into the jet age. Interestingly, Germany, the UK, and the US all developed operational jets before the end of World War II. Germany, the UK, and the US all actually fielded operational jet fighters before the end of World War II. But only the German and Brit jets saw combat during World War II. But there was no jet v. jet combat, unless you count Gloucester Meteors uh, attacking V-1 buzz bombs. Um, the U.S. did uh, have the P-80, the shooting star, in operation, but it never saw action. It got there a little bit too late. Both the German ME-262 and Henkel-162, and then the rocket plane, the ME-163, all saw combat against U.S. bombers and piston engine fighters. The uh, Dorado 234 jet bomber and reconnaissance aircraft was also used in bo as both a bomber and reconnaissance over England, and it, it flew at altitudes and speeds that made it uh, uh, incapable of being intercepted by the RAF. Again, the U.K. developed the Gloucester Meteor. It did see some combat against V-1 buzz bombs. The U.S. developed the Lockheed P-80 but it, and deployed it to Europe, but it did not see combat in World War II. The P-80 was developed by the ubiquitous and the prolific Francis L. Kelly Johnson, who later went on to develop the U-2 and the SR-71. Again, the first jet versus jet fighter combat would have to wait till the 1950s in the Korean War. After the war, the U.S. Uh, realized that the Germans had all sorts of cool technological toys, and we uh, had a program called Operation Paperclip, and that's where we exploited German uh, technologies. And that was everything from uh, nuclear technology, chemical warfare technology, and aviation and rocket technology. So we took uh, the technology they had in rockets, both large and small, like the V-2 and the engines that powered the ME-163, uh, the, the jets like the ME-262 and the Arado-234 and the, the um, Junkers Yumo 004 jet engines that powered them. They had swept wing tailless designs. They had delta and swing wing designs, and we exploited all of that. So you will see several of those aircraft as X-planes later on in the 50s. Horton Brothers had the HO-229 tailless aircraft, which presaged aircraft like the B-2. Uh, Alexander Lippisch had the DM-1 Delta Wing, it was basically like three Deltas stuck together, which led in the U.S. to the XF-92, which begat the F-102 and F-106 fighters, and in Europe you see aircraft like the Mirage 3 Delta Wing aircraft and Mirage 4 Delta Wing bombers. There was rocket aircraft like the ME-163 and the very strange Bakum Natter vertically launched rocket uh, plane, um, which mostly was famous for killing its pilots. It never saw operational use. Here's some videos of those crazy airplanes flying. During the closing days of the war, our pilots over Germany were surprised by an occasional, extremely fast rocket fighter. After the Nazis threw in the towel, the Allies captured several of these rocket-driven planes intact and identified them as of the ME-163 series. These German films of their performance tests were found, leaving little doubt in the minds of our aeronautical engineers and designers just how far in advance the Germans were of our own research and development on this particular type of aircraft. German data on performance of this first rocket fighter ever to be used in combat proved the feasibility of using rocket propulsion in airplanes. 
speed and rate of climb with which a rocket-driven interceptor can meet an enemy squadron is illustrated by this German graph. Built principally of wood and duraluminum, the plane was designed for high-velocity performance. To eliminate possibilities of flutter, the elevators were mounted on the trailing edge of the wing, leaving only the rudder in the tail section. Power is provided by a Walter rocket engine. Weighing only 387 pounds, this unit has a maximum thrust power on the ground of approximately 3,300 pounds. Of simple design and with very few moving parts, it has been determined that this engine is easy to manufacture and needs comparatively little maintenance. An invaluable feature of jet and rocket engines that makes them ideal for interceptors is their ability to develop full power immediately after starting. The ME-163 rocket engine obtains power from the burning action that occurs when a fuel is brought into contact with an oxidizer. The fuel in this instance is a mixture composed principally of methyl alcohol and hydrazine hydrate, and the oxidizer is hydrogen peroxide. Both of these liquids are volatile, and it is their highly combustible nature that makes operation of the ME-163 dangerous. Wheels are attached to the plane for takeoff purposes only. After the plane gets into the air, the wheels are dropped. For landing, a retractable skid is extended from the bottom of the fuselage by pressure from a tank of compressed oxygen. Piloting is done from a conventional type cockpit. Oddly enough, this German test pilot is now cooperating with research engineers in the engineering laboratories at Wright Field. Although flight in the ME-163 was admittedly dangerous, no special provisions were made for pilot ejection in this series. The rocket unit contains a single-stage turbine that is run by steam, which is generated by passing the alcohol-fuel mixture over crystals of potassium or sodium manganate. The turbine, in turn, runs two pumps that deliver the liquids to the combustion chamber, and the aircraft is immediately ready for takeoff. A speed of approximately 200 miles per hour is necessary for the plane to get off the ground due to the small wing area. After the wheels are released, a speed of 430 miles per hour is maintained for the best climbing performance. With that speed, the plane climbs to an altitude of about 22,000 feet in about two and one half minutes. And to reach 40,000 feet takes only a total of three and one half minutes. In these German tests, Maximum speed for the ME-163 at 26,000 feet was about 560 miles an hour and a little over 600 miles at 40,000 feet. Operating at full throttle, the plane is capable of flying for six to nine minutes, but it can stay aloft for over 25 minutes by using a combination of power flying and gliding. Landing speed for this airplane is approximately 180 miles per hour, and an oleo strut mounted on the skid helps to absorb the impact of landing. Influenced by the design and performance of this aircraft, research and development on similar types of interceptors are now being conducted at our Muroc test base in California. U.S. aircraft manufacturers use this captured data for swept wing and delta wing uh, designs to develop new, a whole new generation of American fighter aircraft. Uh, originally a straight wing fighter being developed by North American took this data and instead of being a straight wing aircraft, the North American F-86 Sabre was a swept wing aircraft. The Navy version was the FJ-1 Fury, which was a barrel-shaped straight, uh, straight wing aircraft, and later on it became the FJ-3 and FJ-4 Furies with swept wings. Post-World War II jet transports. 
after World War II, the U.S. was leading the way with uh, aircraft like the Douglas uh, DC-6 uh, and then 7, uh, and the basis of the old DC-4, which was the C-54 in the military. But jets were afoot, and the leader in that revolution was de Havilland with the de Havilland Comet, a four-engine jet transport which first flew in 1949. Interestingly, the Canadians were almost first. The Avro Canada C-102 was beaten into the air by only 13 days by the Comet. Unfortunately, the uh, C-102 never had any sales, although Howard Hughes was interested in it for a while, and it ended up uh, not going anywhere, and its prototypes were scrapped. The Comet went into service in 1952, and after experience of few crashes due to uh, poor airmanship and doing things like flying into thunderstorms, there were several very mysterious unexplained crashes in 1954 when aircraft were lost in flight for unknown reasons. And back at this point, there's not universal radar, and the only way pilots were reporting in was by reporting in, um, doing radio check-ins on the radio. So when a plane didn't check in, you'd had no idea what had happened to it. So they finally found debris from both of these crashes, and after these unexplained crashes in several years of research, it was determined that metal fatigue was the cause of both crashes. The, the pressurization and depressurization uh, cycles encountered by these airplanes on their regularly scheduled flights were um, leading to metal fatigue, which caused catastrophic failure of the aircraft in the air and structural failure. Interestingly, an innovative water tank pressurization rig was used to pressurize and depressurize, put them through cycles, and they had this, the entire Comet airframe in these big water tank, and they would pressurize the water inside it and then release the pressure, and eventually a bulkhead burst, and they, they had the answer. The most intensive probes into the Comet disasters have been carried out at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. One of them involved the testing to destruction of a comet seen here being placed in a special water tank with airbag seals at the points where the wings project on either side. The tank holds 200,000 gallons of water. After it had been filled, jacks beneath the wings caused a series of bumps as if in flight and internal pressure was raised in the fuselage. After the equivalent of 5,000 three-hour flights, metal fatigue resulted in cracks and breaks. Information obtained from many scientific tests Will it's believed lead to new comet triumphs in the future? Some consider the period just before the jet age to be a golden era for air travel. But flying aboard a piston-powered propeller aircraft, well, it wasn't always glamorous. Flights took a lot longer than they do today, and the relentless noise and vibration from the piston engines, well it was exhausting, and most aircraft couldn't fly high enough to avoid bad weather, so you'd be in for a bumpy ride, and you'd better have your air sickness bag ready. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, in 1949, along came a new kind of aircraft. It was sleek, quiet, and nearly twice as fast as some conventional airliners. Cruising at 40,000 feet, it could avoid messy weather. This was the de Havilland Comet. It shattered conventional thinking and proved that jet travel was the future. But the excitement would be short-lived because within months, things started to go seriously wrong. And the leap into the jet age, it wouldn't go as smoothly as hoped. In the 1940s, the British set out to change civil aviation. In fact, they really had no choice, because after the Second World War, American manufacturers had the civil aviation market cornered. At one point, 90% of the world's airline passengers were flying aboard these, American-built Douglas DC-3s. The Americans left the Second World War with a lot of experience designing and building military transport aircraft. After the war, with their industry fully intact, manufacturers could switch to producing civil aircraft based on their military transport designs. But Britain, on the other hand, had to rebuild. Much of its focus during the war had been on building heavy bombers, so it now needed to develop the infrastructure and the expertise to compete in the civil aviation market. If the British were going to become leaders in aerospace, they had better come up with something extraordinary. But a jet-powered airliner? That was dismissed by a lot of people. 
The conventional thinking of the day amongst manufacturers and airlines was that jet engines produced too little power relative to their fuel consumption, and they were just too unreliable for civil aviation. But at the same time, piston engines were approaching their limits. To squeeze out ever more power, they had grown large and complex, with superchargers and dozens of cylinders. This made piston-powered propeller engines increasingly expensive to maintain, and you can only spin a propeller so fast before its efficiency starts to diminish. As part of a larger effort to develop Britain's post-war aviation industry, the de Havilland Aircraft Company was awarded the task of building the world's first jet-powered airliner. Their aircraft, which would later be named the Comet, was developed in secrecy. In fact, untenable designs were deliberately used to confuse competitors. So when the Comet was revealed just three years later in the summer of 1949, it stunned the world. Its sleek lines, swept wings, and four integrated turbojet engines, well, they were straight out of the future. Even today, a lot of this aircraft looks pretty modern, so you can only imagine the impression it would have left on the flying public in 1952. The Comet sent a powerful signal to the world about Britain's newfound superiority in aerospace. Orders poured in, and even in America, where airlines were still skeptical of jets, Pan Am placed orders for a larger lengthened version. The Comet was revolutionary because it had solved a key barrier to efficient jet travel. While turbojets consumed enormous amounts of fuel at lower altitudes where most planes of the era flew, the Comet would instead cruise at an unprecedented 40,000 feet, where the air is thin and there's less drag, allowing the Comet to consume much less fuel. But to allow its passengers to breathe at such high altitude, the cabin needed to be pressurized. And while the Comet wasn't the first airliner to have a pressurized cabin, no other flew so high. The Comet went into service in 1952 and immediately began breaking travel time records. And in doing so, it became a point of national pride for the British public. But here's the thing, in some ways, the Comet was a little too ahead of its time. With such a clean sheet design, there were suddenly so many new variables to work with. There were numerous problems with its electrical and hydraulic systems. But when two comets skidded off the runway in 1952 and 53, the pilots were blamed. It was suspected that they were still flying the comet as if it were a piston-powered airliner, over-rotating the aircraft on takeoff. It was later determined that a design change of the leading edge of the comet's wing was needed, but public confidence in the comet had not been shaken and the British remained enthusiastic about jet-powered air travel. But then, just two months later, another incident, and this time far more catastrophic. A comet leaving Calcutta ominously disintegrated while flying through a severe thunderstorm. And only eight months later, another comet exploded shortly after taking off from Rome. After these rapid succession of incidents, BOIC, the airline with the most comets in service, had no choice but to ground their fleet. The focus shifted to a suspected turbine explosion in one of the engines, so the engine housing on the other comets was reinforced. But public confidence still remained high, and when the comet re-entered service, the airlines had no trouble selling seats. Yet, just three months later, another comet disintegrated over the Mediterranean. Now the entire worldwide fleet of comets had to be grounded, as their certificate of airworthiness was revoked. An unprecedentedly large investigation began, and it would reveal that sudden catastrophic depressurization of the comet's cabin was to blame, essentially causing comets to suddenly explode apart in midair. See, the comet's cycles of pressurization and depressurization were faster than those of any other aircraft. After many cycles, the fuselage began to fatigue and cracks started to form, especially around the comet's square windows, where hard edge corners concentrated stress forces. The entire Comet fleet was grounded for years while the investigation lumbered forward, but in the end, none of the grounded planes would ever fly again. And while de Havilland worked to modify its design, switching to round windows and increasing fuselage thickness, the rest of the world was catching up. Aircraft manufacturers from around the world introduced their own jet-powered offerings, and in 1958, the Boeing 707 entered service, and Douglas began producing the DC-8. That same year, the de Havilland Comet 4 entered service, but it couldn't compete with the American offerings, which were now larger, faster, and more efficient. Only 76 Comet 4s were ever delivered to airlines. That compares to over 500 DC-8s and over 1,000 707s, 
America's stranglehold on the civil aviation market would only grow tighter in the coming decades. According to de Havilland's chief test pilot, Boeing and Douglas both privately admitted that they had learned from the Comet's pressurization problems, and if it were not for the Comet, they could have made the same mistakes. The later, larger, and improved Comets would reliably serve airlines into the 60s and 70s. The Comet last flew commercial passengers in 1980, but there's no question that the Comet paved the way. The British had taken a massive risk and brought the world into the jet age. Unfortunately, the crashes and the bad publicity that followed allowed Boeing to move in with their new 707, which was both faster and carried many more people than the Comet. Later, the Comet 3 and 4 came about, which uh, flew in service with BOAC and other airlines, but uh, de Havilland never quite ca uh, caught back up. The 707 was de derived from an aircraft called the 367-80. This was another proof of concept aircraft. November 70700 is the tail number, is on display at the Udvar Hazy Center in uh, Northern Virginia these days, but it was a sensation. Boeing used their expertise from their two swept wing bombers, the B-47 and the B-52, to develop the 367-80, which led to two different swept wing jets. A tanker for the U.S. Air Force to keep up with the fast jet bombers, that was the KC-135. The KC-135 was badly needed to replace the KC-97s, which were based on the, originally on the B-29 and the 367 uh, um, tankers. And it was very difficult for the modern jet bombers to refuel behind this old piston engine plane. There was a transport for the airlines developed from the 367-80, the much bigger and faster than the Comet 707. D. Hevelin never caught back up to Boeing despite correcting their original problems. And Douglas also tried to match Boeing with what they called their paper airplane, the DC-8. The airlines loved Douglas so much that when Donald Douglas just showed him basically the design for the new DC-8, he hadn't even cut metal yet. He got all, uh, many of the airlines like United to actually start buying airplanes before it was even flown. That's how much they trusted him. But Boeing ended up dominating Douglas in the jet transport field, much as Douglas had dominated Boeing in the 30s, 40s, and 50s with their piston engine aircraft. Remember, it was the Boeing 247 was one of the first modern twin-engine all-metal monoplane transports, but the Douglas DC-1, 2, and then the 3 just sort of wiped it off the map. Um, Boeing came up with the 307, the world's first pressurized airliner, but then uh, Douglas came along and uh, Lockheed came along with the Lockheed Constellation, and Douglas's DC-4 just uh, and the DC-3 just uh, outdid uh, Boeing. After the war, the... Uh, DC-6 and the DC-7 outclassed Boeing's uh, 367 and 377 Stratoliners based on the B-29. Okay, now let's talk about post-war, the Cold War air concepts. After World War II, the Soviet Union had most of Eastern Europe and the Allies Western Europe and the Western portions of Germany and the Western half of Berlin. And as Winston Churchill said, an iron curtain descended across Europe since I can't find a copyright-free version of this to use in this video, you get to listen to my imitation of Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and their populations around them lie in the Soviet sphere and are subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in many cases increasing measure of control from Moscow. And now we had not a hot war, not a fighting war, a shooting war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but a cold war. And a combination of air power now with nuclear weapons changed the way people thought about war. And now the United States, with the nuclear monopoly, um, many people thought that the age of the bomber had finally arrived. It's like the post-World War I theorists thought. Maybe Duhay was right after all. Many publications in the post-war era were focused on air power. Air power had won World War II. You know, it, obviously, it took an army to invade, but 
unlike World War I, where air power was kind of a sidelight and an interesting offshoot, by World War II, if you didn't have an air force, if you didn't have air superiority, you couldn't win the war. So air power was clearly important. <clears throat> President Harry Truman established a temporary five-man commission that was supposed to inquire into all phases of aviation, and they drafted a national air policy report. The commission was also known as the Finletter Commission because Thomas K. Finletter served as the chairman of this Air Policy Commission. On January 1, 1948, they sent to the president a report called Survival in the Air Age. The report called for more aeronautical research and development to strengthen civil aviation and a huge leap, a 70-group air force. This was a huge number of airplanes, and this was seen as necessary to defend the United States uh, against potential enemies like the Soviet Union. The uh, Congress didn't go for 70 groups, but they finally agreed with the president on 66 groups. But this is a huge number of aircraft. I mean, hundreds of bombers were built, hundreds and thousands of fighters were built. What was clear was that in the nuclear age, air power was the key to national security. Okay, let's switch gears to presidential aircraft. Turns out that the first president ever to fly was Theodore Roosevelt although he wasn't president at the time. On 11 October 1910, Teddy Roosevelt became the US president, first U.S. president to fly an aircraft, an early Wright Flyer piloted by Arch Hoxley near St. Louis, Missouri. Again, he was not in office at the time. He was uh, an ex-president, but still. The first president to fly uh, in, while he was president was FDR. He flew to Casablanca, the Casablanca Conference in January of 1943 to coordinate with uh, Churchill and other Allied leaders on the invasion of North Africa, he flew across in a, in a Boeing 314 flying boat called the Dixie Clipper. After FDR died, uh, Truman had a C-54 that was decked out for him that was called the Sacred Cow. And then when Eisenhower came along, he flew in a modified uh, Lockheed VC-121 constellation, which was named Columbine. President Kennedy got the new Boeing 707, um, which was basically a militarized uh, version of the 707 called the VC-137 in 1962. President George H.W. Bush was the first to use the current aircraft, the then new VC-25, in 1990. And you may recall the iconic photograph after President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. He flew there on the VC-137, and then shortly after he was declared dead, uh, then Vice President Johnson was administered the oath of office in the tail of the, that aircraft, and then he came home with President Kennedy's body. Okay, let's talk about supersonic flight. First off, what's supersonic flight? It's flying faster than the speed of sound. Well, did anything go faster than the speed of sound? Because back then people were talking about the sound barrier, yet um, bullets and artillery shells routinely went faster than the speed of sound. It's about 1,100 feet per second, so if you have a rifle bullet that goes over that, that's supersonic. Um, whips, when they crack, the tip of that whip is going supersonic. That's the crack. And other things are supersonic, like if you make your propeller go too fast, it can go supersonic and you end up uh, causing shock waves and generating lots of heat and noise, but not much thrust. So supersonic flow was sort of known, but making an airplane, the whole airplane go supersonic was a different story. There were reports of aircraft like P-38s, P-47s, P-51s in dives supposedly going faster than the speed of sound or near the speed of sound. But unfortunate things happen. Turns out that the center of lift moves aft, so the airplane pitches down. Um, the uh, shock waves form on the wing and uh, the tail, which makes the ailerons and the elevators uh, not functional. And if you didn't slow down enough as you went, went uh, deeper into the dense atmosphere, many airplanes uh, crashed or they fell apart because of the structural loads. So both the NACA and the Air Force and the Navy wanted to know more about supersonic flight. So how to test. We had good wind tunnel data up to maybe point Mach 
uh, Mach 0.8. And beyond that, like at Mach 1.5 and beyond, we had wind tunnels that could do that, shock tunnels. But the transonic region, the area between, say, 0.9 and 1.2 Mach, we couldn't duplicate that in, in wind tunnels. We would get weird internal uh, shock wave uh, reflections, and the data was unreliable, and we didn't have mathematical ways. So the only way to do it was an airplane, a test plane, an X-plane. So Bell won the contract for the rocket-powered X, XS-1, the Experimental Sonic 1. And it was rocket-powered because jet engines at that time just couldn't provide the sufficient thrust. So the NAC and the Air Force both needed flight tests, again, since no wind tunnels could operate in that area, the transonic region. The fuselage was based by Bell on a 50 caliber bullet. So why a 50 caliber bullet? Well, first it goes supersonic, but more importantly, when it decelerates through the transonic, the bullet remains stable. So they decided, let's pick that, that uh, shape. And here's some cool videos of uh, artillery shells and uh, bullets going uh, supersonic, and you get to see the shock waves, what they call Schlerian photography. Um, so let's watch these videos, and you'll at least get to see some cool shock waves. Now, aren't you glad you saw that? So the rocket engine that was used was a Reaction Motors company, XLR-11. This is a four-chamber rocket at four individual combustion chambers. Each produced 1,500 pounds of thrust. Each chamber was either off or on. So you had no thrust, 1,500, 3,000, 4,500, or 6,000 pounds of thrust. Those were your options. There were a number of test flights, uh, first at Pine Castle Air Force Base, now known as Orlando International Airport um, in Florida. And it uh, initially was test dropped as a glider, and Jack Willems, a, uh, the Boeing, or excuse me, the Bell test pilot, would, would uh, test it there just to make sure it flew okay. Then early flights out at Edwards where they would test it with the rocket. And once they got it up to about 0.8 Mach, the Bell contract was fulfilled because they basically, they couldn't guarantee an airplane would go transonic or supersonic. So once they did that, it was now they handed the aircraft over to the NACA and the Air Force, and it was up to NACA and Air Force test pilots to fly the aircraft. After a series of flights going incre incrementally faster, on 14 October 1947, re memorize that date, it'll be on a quiz and a test. 14 October 1947, Chuck Yeager achieved a speed of Mach 1.06 in level flight. So again, memorize that date. It's interesting because if you did your significant date of 14 October 1947, you didn't find anything. And why didn't you find anything? Because it was secret. So that was part of the deal. This was a secret deal that um, the U.S. didn't want anybody to know about because um, we didn't want the commies to know that we'd gone supersonic. The X-1 became the first of a long, very long series of productive X-planes. Um, and some of them went fast, some of them went slow, some of them went straight up and down. Some of them were very, uh, very productive, some of them crashed. But you can look today and there's a lot of uh, data and a lot of um, technology we see today and take for granted that was developed by X-planes. I'll have a whole number, series of videos on just the X-plane. You're welcome. Some of the things that they found out from just the early flights of the X-1, the X-2, and some other aircraft, like the Navy had their D-558-1 and D-558-2, a jet and a rocket-powered uh, X-plane. And they weren't technically X-planes, but uh, they were experimental aircraft. And uh, they were run by the Navy and NACA and the Air Force. And the Navy and the Air Force competed back and forth to see who could go faster. One of the first things they discovered with the uh, X-1 was the use of an all-moving horizontal stabilizer. Normally, like in Piper airplanes, where the whole, whole elevator or whole horizontal stabilizer moves, and not just the elevator, um, Chuck Yeager found that above certain speeds, the elevator effectiveness fell off, and he could pull the yoke you know, back and forth and nothing would happen, but he could use elevator trim to pitch trim the airplane. Now, if you look at all modern jet fighters, look at an F-15, an F-16, um, they all, the whole horizontal stabilizer moves. Another thing they found out was inertia coupling. As the airplanes got faster, you notice they got longer and narrower and their wings were shorter. And what you ended up uh, having was aircraft where as if you turned and yawed into a turn, the inertia would go through uh, like helicopters, 90 degrees off, and the airplane would go into a pitch instability. 
Unfortunately, that cost the test pilot his life and they destroyed an X-2 that way. But they found this out and later they determined that we had lost several F-100 Super Savers due to this phenomenon, but nobody quite understood it. So it was X-plane research that immediately led to a larger vertical stabilizer on the F-100 and that problem went away. Other problems they found is the faster you go, even at high altitudes, uh, temperature becomes a problem, thermal problems. You had aluminum wasn't good enough, and even steel, and so you ended up having airplanes like the X-15, which were made out of nickel steel, and even their later flights at high Mach had ablative coatings to carry off heat. The X-15 ended up becoming one of the most productive X-planes. It flew 199 times and set several absolute speed records. It used the new XLR-99 engine, which wasn't available initially. Um, the first X-15 flights used two XLR-11, so it had you know, basically two four-chamber rockets. But then finally the XLR-99 was available. It was a throttleable, throttleable say that 10 times fast, it was throttleable from 30,000 to 60,000 pounds of thrust. The X-15's achievements were a max speed of Mach 6.72, max altitude of 365,000 feet, it was the first aircraft to go into space. It went above 100 kilometers, and the first astronauts were X-15 pilots. They got their astronaut wings. Here's a cool video of the X-15 on the test stand, and you get to watch it blow up. We'd run an engine as a test engine several times, and things were looking pretty good. And you know, a lot of these developments are such you run into trouble and trouble and trouble, and all of a sudden things begin working. We were on that curve. The last engine run before the first flight with the big engine, I was in the cockpit. This was just a ground run, so I was just in a white shirt and my business suit pants and sitting in the airplane running the darn thing. It's just like being in the sun. Everything around me was orange. I stayed in there because I had a good idea that being in that steel X-15 with a, all that fire around me was probably a better, I was better off than trying to get out. And here comes an Air Force fuel truck with water coming out of it like Niagara Falls. And in the bottom of that waterfall was a guy named Art Simone, one of our mechanics. I still kind of choke up because he was coming through that fire to look after me, and I was better off than he was by far. I was in this big steel thing. And he came up and got to the airplane. Of course, I couldn't wave him away because all of that bright shining on the windshield, he, he didn't know whether I was alive or dead. And he would try to open the canopy, and every time he put his hands on the fuselage, he'd jerk him away. I could see his flesh searing. He just didn't, didn't have the power against his reflex action to keep his hands on there long enough. I didn't want to crawl across the, that hot fuselage, and so I just jumped out. And I, la you know, I didn't wait for anything. As soon as the canopy came open, I jumped out and I landed on him, and we got out of there. And nobody really was injured in that whole thing, fortunately. Him or me, his hands were burned, but not really as bad as I, I thought. He just didn't, didn't have his hands on there long enough to make a very serious burn back. I went in the office right after that, and before we could even tell the company that a $50 million airplane was spread all over the landscape, the, the media started calling. They have good pipelines. <laughs> I told them, relax. The only casualty was the press of my trousers. The fireman got me all wet when I, when I jumped out of the airplane. And then I winced when I, when I knew what I'd given the bastards, because sure enough, that old story, East Coast newspaper comes out with X-15, blows up pilot wet's pants. <laughs> it gets your attention, I'll tell you that. You're not scared. You're too busy 
wondering, hey, there's got to be a hole out of this thing. Huh? There's got to be a door. That, that seems to be the nature of people like me. They're always trying to figure out what, where's, my, where's my back door. And frankly, after it was all over, uh, you're just damn ticked off that you lost a good airplane. Okay, now time for something near and dear to my heart. The U.S. Air Force is born. Don't have to hang around with those Army pukes anymore. The National Security Act of 1947 created the Department of Defense, whereas there had been a Department of War, and the new and independent U.S. Air Force. The U.S. Air Force, uh, within a year of coming into being as a separate uh, military force, was tested uh, in a real way, um, but in a very strange way. The Berlin Airlift started in 1948 and went through 1949. This was due to the fact that the Soviet Union, not being particularly enamored of the fact that the Allies controlled west, the western half of Berlin, which was inside East Germany. So if you look at the map, the, the Soviets had the eastern half of Germany, the Allies had the western half of Germany. So the U.S., the U.K., and France each had a sector in West Germany. The Soviets controlled the eastern half. But Berlin itself, being the capital, the eastern half of Berlin was Soviet-controlled, and the western half was split between the U.S., the U.K., and France. So we had normally had uh, rail, truck, and barge traffic supplying the city, but because the Soviets thought that the U.S. wasn't going to go to war over West Berlin, they blockaded the, uh, the rail and the highway and the, the canal ports, and so nothing could get in or out. So it ended up that Berlin was completely blockaded by the Soviet Union. The Soviets think the U.S. will just eventually capitulate. But we ended up using air power in a sort of ad hoc way, and then later a very organized fashion, to completely supply the city of Berlin by air. And I'll think about that. That's coal, that's uh, gasoline, diesel fuel, that's food, that's milk, that's flour, eggs, everything you need to run a city of a couple of million people has to come in just by air. It uh, ended up after about a year when the Soviets realized the fact that we could operate 24-7, 365, and resupply uh, West, Germany or West Berlin by air, and we would do it and keep on doing it. They backed down. But the important part was this was the first time air power was ever really used in lieu of actual combat. It was air logistics that made the difference here. And we'll see that again in several wars. The uh, Arab-Israeli War in 1967, the, uh, well, even the, the U.S.-Vietnam War, um, and then wars like in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, where our ability to resupply our forces anywhere end up dominating. So it's a battle of logistics. Some of the other stuff that came on, there were new air traffic control systems, a ground control approach, what we now call a precision approach radar, was used so that on bad weather, um, aircraft could land. And new maintenance techniques, which you don't think of maintenance as being a sort of strategic necessity, but instead of having aircraft down for depot or phase maintenance, you know, being out for a week or two weeks, they would be down for like three or four days. So the rapid uh, development of routine maintenance techniques um, which meant more aircraft were available to fly more frequently, end up being a direct dividend to, to the airlines. One other thing we should mention from the Berlin Airlift was uh, Der Schokolottenflieger, the chocolate flyer, Colonel, well now Colonel Gail Halverson was a lieutenant and captain back then, and he was the one that uh, saw all the kids sitting at the end of the runway watching airplanes. These are the kids that just a few years before, you know, we had been bombing uh, during the uh, end of World War II. And now here we were feeding them, but a lot of these kids had nothing to do. They were living in bombed out houses. And so as just a you know, gesture to them, he had some chocolate bars and candy and made little handkerchief parachutes and threw them out the window right at the approach end of the field. Um, he got to be known because as, a, as a, was a Captain Wiggles, because he would wiggle his wings so the pl people would know who, uh, which airplane he was in. Um, when the brass found out about this at first, they didn't like it because they didn't want a lot of kids hanging out at the end of the runways because of an airplane crash and you wipe out a bunch of kids, that looks bad. So, but eventually they realized how popular this was. And so people all over the U.S. ended up donating candy. Hershey's donated candy and people made up parachutes. And this became quite a deal. And you can find um, people talking 40, 50 years later after this, adults who were kids then, and they still have tears in their eyes about how important this was. So be nice to the kids. <laughs>
Okay, we shift gears again from air power uh, being used in lieu of actual combat for logistics to a hot war. Uh, the Korean War starts in 1950 when uh, the Koreans, the North Koreans, the communist-led North Koreans, attack South Korea. Korea had been invaded by Japan, and after the war, it was split between the Soviets, or the communists, and the, uh, the, uh, the Western forces. And so you had about the 38th parallel of latitude, a split between North and South Korea. The North Koreans wanted to take over the whole peninsula, and the, the Allies really just were caught off guard. We weren't ready for an air war. Um, we were, had been demobilizing for five years, and we were ready to get on with peace and prosperity and suburbs and buying new cars and building new houses and having babies. And so we weren't ready. But uh, the bad news was the, the North Koreans pushed the Allies, the Koreans and the Allies, all the way down to the southeast uh, port of Pusan, and it was a pretty close thing. But then uh, General MacArthur has his uh, invasion plan. He goes behind the North Korean lines to Incheon, which is, has horribly high and low tides, and makes a gamble, invades an uh, invasion force there, catches the Koreans off guard, and almost cuts the peninsula in two, and almost locks uh, thousands and thousands of Korean troops below that line. Um, the Allies end up going on an offensive to the north, almost getting to completely taking over North Korea, when suddenly, the Chinese get involved in the war and hundreds of thousands of Korean troops come across the border. And then we get pushed back down. And then for the next couple of years, basically fight back and forth at around the 38th parallel, which is where we end up. So we end up killing a lot of people and nobody really gains much territory. But the air war was, was rather unique. Um, we were using initially aircraft like the P-51 and using some strategic bombing of like the B-29, but North Korea really didn't make much. So you could do maybe interdiction, but strategic bombing didn't make much sense. Our first jets were introduced during the Korean War, like the P-80 and the F-84. We, we changed from P to F uh, there in the 50s. And later the Chinese and the Soviets introduced the MiG-15. And so finally we start seeing jet versus jet combat. Um, Turns out that the first jet v. jet combat was a US P-80 versus a North Korean MiG-15. A Lieutenant Russell Brown ends up the victor, so US one, Korean nothing. Um, but it, it ended up becoming a lot closer fought. When the new F-86 came in, the MiG-15s that they were meeting were much fight faster, lighter, and more agile, and they had a cannon. The 37 millimeter cannon, if it hit the F-86, it was bad news, but it had a relatively slow firing rate. The F-86 had six 50 caliber machine guns, which weren't as damaging, but you had high volumes of fire and were more likely to strike the, uh, the enemy aircraft. Fighter bombers blast brown targets in Korea, but overhead there is high drama as Sabre jets flying cover tangle with red MiGs at more than 10 miles a minute. pilot gets it in his sights and flies through the smoke as his wingman clobbers another red who starts down. This MiG blows up in the Sabre's face. Happy hunting. The U.S. pilots were mostly better trained as well because almost all of them initially had combat experience from World War II. Their leaders certainly did. And uh, whereas the North Koreans, uh, not so much, although there was also some Chinese and uh, Soviet pilots that flew there, um, technically illegally, but it ended up that the U.S. fighter pilots achieved about a 10 to 12 to 1 kill ratio over the North Korean and Chinese and Soviet MiGs. And that was mostly because of good training and experience. Uh, it was, certainly wasn't because of the airplane. So the F-86 was a good airplane, but in, if you had equal pilots in both airplanes, the MiG should win. So we ended up uh, using training and uh, experience to win over. <laughs> 